Good evening. Welcome to the City Council uh, meeting for June uh, 4th, 2013. Can everyone hear me? We have a new microphone system. It's got a red button, so it should be on. So bear with me as I work my way through this new system. Um, okay, I hear feedback. Well, first we'll start our invocation with Minister, Minister Ellis Lewis of Church of Christ and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Sotelo. Please rise. Do we have Minister Ellis Lewis? Good evening and thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Continue to give you thanks, honor, and praise for all that you do for us. Thanking you for watching over us and taking care of us and bringing us this far. And we ask you to look down upon us this evening in love and mercy as we come before you in prayer and especially as we gather here in this assembly hall. I want to pray for our administrators and our, our civic leaders that you give them your wisdom, guide them as they uh, direct our city. We just pray your blessings upon all of us that are here this evening. And we're praying that the decisions that will be made and laws that will be made will be those that will be helpful and benefit in our city and our citizens. We ask you to be with us always, Heavenly Father. God, guide and direct us as we go our way. Protect us. Keep us safe in this land in which we love. We want to pray for our leaders everywhere. And we especially pray for the ones who lead the city and the West Covina, as well as those who lead our country. We pray and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Sanderson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Herford. Here. Council Member McIntyre. Here. Council Member Sotelo. Here. Council Member Sykes. Here. Thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager, reporting out from closed session. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. The record should reflect the City Council convened this evening for closed session on the uh, special meeting agenda. Uh, with all five members being present, that prior to recessing into closed session, the items that were listed on the closed session agenda were uh, announced for discussion, and the following is my report. Under conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, there was one matter that was discussed. Direction was provided to uh, the city attorney's office with respect to this matter, but there was no final action taken, and there's nothing further to report. Under conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the Johnson versus City of uh, West Covina matter. On that matter, direction was provided to the city attorney's office with uh, Councilmember Sykes uh, dissenting with that direction, uh, but there was no final action taken and there is nothing to report at this time. That concludes my report at clo of closed session. It's appropriate to continue with the open portion of the meeting. Thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager. Are there any changes to the agenda? No, there are no changes to the agenda tonight. Okay, thank you so much. And at this time, I'll come forward and we have a few presentations this evening. It's always uh, a wonderful thing to be doing, but yet sometimes bittersweet heart when we um, lose some of the people in our community that are so important to us. And so I hope that they continue to uh, still be active. And so I'll come forward and I'll do a few presentations. It's awfully quiet this evening. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Our first person I'd like to recognize blessed us with the um, invocation, and we really appreciate you being here. I'd like to call forward Minister Ellis Lewis from Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ is located on the border of West Covina and La Pointe on Amaro Road. Minister Lewis 
Sr. is retiring after 42 years of service and the City Council and the citizens of West Covina would like to thank you and give you a certificate of recognition. Mr. Ellis Lewis Sr. for 42 years of dedicated service to the Church of Christ. We really appreciate that. If you'd like to say a few brief words. Thank you very much. I just want to, <clears throat> want to say that my family and I have uh, we've lived in West Covina now almost 50 years, from August of this year. And I just want to, my wife is here, she's not able to stand, but I want my children and grandchildren to stand and be recognized. And we have others that are from our, our church, but we just uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, what we have been blessed with here in this city over the years and I haven't regretted one iota that I moved from Los Angeles <laughs> some 50 years ago and we have been we hope a great blessing to the not only the city of West Covina but the communities surrounding because our, our church draw from all of our communities in this area Covina, Baldwin Park, uh, Hacienda Heights and so forth. I taught school for 25 years uh, in this area as well, and maybe some of you students I might have taught. And, but uh, I also have another one of our great teachers, 32 years over here, a member of our church. He taught at Roland High School for 32 years. I didn't teach there for two years, but he, uh, but we, we, we're happy to be here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next individual I'd like to call forward, and before I do so, I have this page that I was just handed, and it's quite long, which would mean that it's going to take me a while to read. This is in reference to our police chief, Frank Wills. And you know, it's hard for me to stand here. I'm actually having a hard time. Didn't think I would. And he's going to stay around, right? Um, when you have valuable people in your community that have touched your heart and done such a fantastic job as a leader, you just don't know what to say when they say that they're moving on. This is a list that he assumed leadership of the police department of 114 sworn peace officers, brought it to an all-time high of 127 sworn implemented the community service area policing, expanded the West Covina service group services for 20 other police, 24 other police agencies, thereby increasing the revenue to the city, maintain, out, maintain outstanding level of police service with the city of a personal drop of over 30%. Now, pardon my reading, I do have glasses on, but I still can't see a larger font, please next time. Uh, <laughs> Pursued, and maybe uh, the tears in the eyes aren't helping either, pursued development of involvement of a, a missing child program which utilizes the resources of Florida-based company located missing persons, updated California Highway Patrol contract with increased revenues from the department range, devoted much of his personal time serving on the board of directors for the Union Sanitation San Station Foundation, Pacific Clinics, Girls Clubs of Pasadena, Community Arms Housing Project Governing Board, the San Gabriel Valley. See, I told you it was long. D uh, UMCA, Rotary, and an array of many other community organizations. Past president of the San Gabriel Valley po uh, Police Chiefs Association, an active member in the Los Angeles County Chiefs Association, California Associate Chiefs of Police, International Chiefs of Police Association, creatively utilized many external funding sources, including federal, state, and private grants. Asset forfeiture, 1033 program, surplus equipment, community donations. I haven't called him forward because he'd probably be very embarrassed to be standing here while I'm reading a two-page document. I mean, the list goes on. Um, he's an amazing man, and I have, of course, would not let him go without receiving one of our city tiles that I'm going to bring him forward. He also brought West Covina's great program 
international prominence, keynote speaker, conference moderator of the 2008 National Great Conference, the first chief from Western United States to ever serve in that capacity. He's been a guest lecturer at numerous policing conferences across the United States, specializing in proactive policing and sharing with other agencies on how effectively to address crime problems with limited resources. Over five million in grants obtained, over 10 million in narcotics assets forfeiture obtained from the city. West Covina is a safer city today with lower crime rates than when Chief Wills was appointed to chief in 1998. The first LA County city implementing the TEX 911 program implemented social network sites for the department, brought national recognition to the department's volunteer shop program, awarded National Police Volunteer Program of the Year in 2000, created graffiti abatement team resulting in over 1,500 graffiti arrests, over 70% of them were felons, over 90% of a conviction ratio. Um, there's less graffiti now in West Covina and uh, graffiti uh, reward program and the civil penalty program hold parents financially accountable for graffiti and crime committed by their children, maintain a highly effective, motivated, well-trained police force in the face of the most severe budget cuts in the city's history. At this time of retirement, he was one of California's longest serving chiefs of police with over 20 years of service as a chief. And with that, I would like to call forward our police chief, Frank Wills. Good applause, please. Thank you. I can see. Thank you all so much for that because that's what he means to this community and this is what you mean to us and I, I want, I'm honored to be standing here today to present you with the Police of Chief Frank Wills uh, resolution of commendation on behalf of the citizens of West Covina and the City Council we thank you for all you've done and we really do appreciate it and of course the city tile Police Chief Frank Wills in appreciation of over 14 years of dedicated service to the city of West Covina, 1998 to 2013. Thank you so very much. And we, um, again, I, I was surprised I'm having a hard time. I'm, we're going to miss you, and you better stay active in our community. And, of course, I want to hand over the mic to you to uh, say a few words, and, and I do appreciate you partaking in this because it means a lot to me for to, to be able to stand here and, and do that for you. So. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for turning my back to you. You know, this, if you look at your agenda, this wasn't on the agenda tonight, and I really thought I could get through this and avoid having to appear here. Those of you that know me well, I could make a speech in front of 10,000 people tomorrow unrehearsed and feel comfortable, but when I'm the center of attention, it's a torture beyond description. But, but since I do have the mic, I do want to thank the men and women of the West Covina Police Department. You're so fortunate to have them serving you. They're well-trained, they're dedicated, they work very hard, devote countless hours, and I've worked in five cities now, it's the finest group of men and women I've ever worked with. Um, fellow department heads, thank you, we have quite a team, Nita, you're new, and, and, I, and Jeff's up there, and Sue, and, and Mike, and, and, and Shannon, and, and Chris Freeland. We have a great team, we work very hard to provide you the best service possible. I want to thank the citizens for all your support for public safety. I've always thought these retirement celebrations were, were almost done backwards. Uh, um, I'm, I'm well aware that it's uh, the business owners and taxpayers in this community that have paid my salary, put a roof over my head, fed my children, and, and I just tried my best to give you a good return on your investment. Um, since we don't have, you know, I, I was hoping this wouldn't occur tonight. I didn't invite my fiance, my family, my friends, even other officers in the department. So um, I, they're not all here for me to thank. So instead, maybe I'll talk about the, the city manager and city council for just a moment, and then I'll give the mic back, maybe just a minute or two. But uh, Chris, Chris Chung, my friend of 14 years, I know this is your doing, and, and I appreciate it. We've been debating back and forth for several weeks, and he wanted to do it, I didn't, and, and he felt he had to do it. And, uh, I'm not too angry, but I know it comes from the heart, and thank you. 
and thank you. You know, and I, and I feel guilty. I, I, I really expected to be here for, for a few more years. A great opportunity came, and, and I feel guilty leaving Chris this, this early. Uh, but when you're raised Catholic, you feel guilty about everything anyway. I mean, it's, just, it, it, it's, it's in your subconscious. But, uh, and I don't want to give away state secrets, but Chris has done a fantastic job. I think we're going to have a balanced budget. And he's just a dynamo, and he's decisive in support of public safety. And it's resonated very well with the men and women of public safety. In terms of the council, it's, it's an impossible job. And thank you and former council members over the years for, for your support. Um, you know, Fred Sykes, who I've known probably the least amount of time, treats everybody with class and dignity. And, and, and Rob Sotelo, so many people think he's a, he's a newbie to, to the city, but if you've been here for any length of time, he and his great wife, Sue, have, they've devoted decades and decades of service to this city. If you've ever had a child or one of your loved ones in any type of youth sports in this city, you have the Sotelo family to thank, and Rob's been a leader in that for, for many, many decades, and he's not a, a newbie at all, but, but he's a very seasoned veteran in, in community service. Um, Andy, Councilmember McIntyre, I'm sorry to use your first names, I should be respectful, but uh, my former father-in-law and your grandfather were good friends, and, and I remember when I, when I first came to West Covey and he said, uh, the McIntyre company is, is, is the type of business you want in a community. They make a fair profit. Uh, they're business people, but they also give back. They live and work in the communities they serve. And, and uh, I, I remember your father, when we had a, a, an officer dying a few years back, uh, wrote a very, very generous check uh, and asked that it not be publicized or talked about at all. And, and I'm violating that promise tonight, but uh, uh, your family uh, has done wonders for this community, and, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, Steve Herford, probably the, the one I've known the longest and one of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. And, and, I, and, and if I ever had a concern with Steve, I, it's just the public doesn't understand what he is like behind closed doors. Um, he's funny. He's warm. He visits you know, people in the hospital. He was a, a son to a woman in our city that, that had no family and, and was in the hospital taking care of her, cleaning her house. I mean, he treated her better than a son would have treated, treated her. And, um, you, you know, people don't realize he's a Badge of Courage Award winner, one of the first elected officials in California ever to be recognized for service to youth um, uh, by the Boy Scouts of America. Um, there's, there's people that uh, in this community, you don't always see it. He, he, he almost works better with the underdogs than he does with the big shots in this community. Um, if there's somebody in this community that's not served well, that doesn't have access to government, that needs help, he's in the office or on the phone with them and says, hey, Government needs to provide service. Here's a, here's a resident in need. Help him out. I mean, he's got one of the biggest hearts uh, of anybody I've ever worked with. He's just a, a fantastic, fantastic human being. Steve, it's been such a pleasure to work with you. And, uh, and one more Steve Herford story. And this is uh, for years and years he was part of uh, the Rotary Foundation. And, and the day before Christmas, he had his own busy family, his own family he needed to take care of. He's out there giving Christmas baskets to the underprivileged in this community. The media wasn't there. I mean, not only were these people not voters, it wasn't about politics. Many of them weren't even American citizens. He's down there on his knees trying to give these underprivileged kids a happy Christmas, and they were hugging them, and it's just, I, and, and if people in the community would have seen that or could see it, and we had captured it in photographs, uh, uh, your feelings for this man would be like, like mine are. And uh, Mayor Sanderson, I, we, we probably talked the most, any council members were on the phone all the time. I know you care deeply about the residents of this community. You care about the people you serve, and it doesn't always come across. This is an artificial gathering in the council, but but you're a very warm and gracious human being who who works very hard to serve the residents here, and it's been an honor to work with all of you. Thank you very much. And and, and in closing, you know, in, in 100 years ago, I'm a student of history, and and, and statesmen used to always close the letters with. Uh, um, always your faithful service, servant, so I'll close with that. I, I leave in my formal capacity, but uh, this is a city I was born and raised in. I grew up in this community and, and uh, hope to uh, see you all down the road a bit and uh, always be your faithful servant. Thank you so much.
Okay, uh, our next part of our meeting is our oral communications. And um, I have to get all my papers together here. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, did you want to say, if, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I guess before we do our communications, I'd like to give the opportunity for the council to try and figure out how to work their new microphones first. <laughs> and okay. secondly, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Steve Herbert. Well, first off, um, we've two dignified guests tonight. Uh, Reverend Lewis, congratulations on your retirement. I'm sorry I couldn't make the event. I too retired and I happened to be out of town for three weeks, but uh, Best of luck to you and your family, David. We've known you guys for a long time, and I know you're going to have a great retirement, so enjoy it. Uh, Chief Wills, uh, what can you say? A man who comes up uh, on his retirement night and tells how, everybody, how great everybody else is instead of himself. Um, when we go to bed at night here in the city of West Covina, um, the city council isn't in charge. Um, the police department and the fire department are out there protecting us 24-7. And the guy that's at the top of that uh, in the police department is, of course, our police chief, Frank Wills. And I have to tell you that uh, we have been secure for the amount of time that he's been here. It's been a uh, tremendous police force under his leadership. We will have a tough time uh, replacing Chief Wills. And uh, more than anything, he's an ambassador for the city of West Covina, and he'll be an ambassador for his, uh, his new uh, job where he goes. Um, but Frank grew up like I did in, in the city here, um, played Little League in the same park, and, and ironically, neither one of us could remember playing against each other, but uh, he, uh, he always wanted to come back to the city that he grew up in. And he, Frank, I, I, on behalf of all the residents of the city, I mean, you, your stress level, your um, amount of work you put into this city to protect us, um, it is sincerely appreciated. Uh, it's not an easy job. You're up 24-7, you're out uh, making calls in the middle of the night or informing the council, the city manager, you're dealing with budget issues, union issues. Probably the toughest job, um, maybe even tougher than the city manager's position, but uh, you did it with a great heart. You, uh, you talk about me going and talking to elderly women or being a friend with somebody. Frank Wills is a friend to everybody. I don't know anybody that doesn't like Chief Frank Wills. And, um, that's the type of person he is, and uh, I could say so much more, and, and I probably should have prepared something, but uh, more than anything to, I think, everybody here in the audience, uh, and not just on the council, but uh, Chief Wills is a friend to everyone, and we thank you for protecting us. Thank you. Thank you for those words again. I appreciate you being the good sport that you are, and uh, we do you know, I'm going to miss you. It, it's a, it, again, it's a hard night for me. Uh, a couple other things I, I want to say um, tonight is I want to thank the residents that have been supportive of me, supportive of me, and approached me over the last few weeks um, after attending recent council meeting. Um, their support really, really means a lot. I don't know if any of you are here tonight or watching on the cable uh, or the TV. Um, and there's just something I want to just make a couple quick announcements before we begin our oral communications. And um, I just wanted to say from my position, um, I've been absent from a couple meetings and from a few events recently, and I, I want to greatly apologize for that. However, I'm, I'm dealing with some major medical issues, and I hope, you know, things are going to go well for me. And I just want to thank those that have been supportive and, and understand. Um, and then uh, in reference to we are going to have our oral communications and with that we have those of you that haven't been to our meetings before I want to make sure that you feel welcome and uh, understand that sometimes we don't might not respond well first of all there's yellow cards at the top of the stairs and you can complete and turn them into the city clerk and we do have a five minute speaking limit where you can address the council on any items um, within the city's jurisdiction and that a law allows for the public to come and, and to talk to us about um, items within our, our city and things that we do work on. However, um, the law does not allow us to go into full detail about uh, like a non-agendized item. Um, if you look at uh, code section, government code section 54945 number two, um, that when you address the council on items that are not on the agenda, we're prohibited from fully dis dis going into a conversation. And the reason I'm saying that is because I want to make sure that the community understands that we want to work to resolve any issues that you that you may have 
um, but we're limited in what we can say. Um, and when you address the council, just the council is a council body that is also in our section. And, and I guess the reason I want to bring this up tonight is I need your assistance in helping me do my job, which is to try and keep decorum and order at the meetings. And I want to make them as pleasant as possible for everybody and get our city's business taken care of. And mostly, I want you to feel comfortable when you come up here that you can talk to us and know that we really do care and, and, and really do have your concerns at heart. And I would be willing to meet with anyone, as well as if you have an issue on a street or a tree, you know, we can get you to the right person or maybe something problems with the garbage or, or a police issue. Um, we, that's what we're here to do. And so I just wanted to make those quick announcements and, again, thank everybody that has supported me. And, and I really do really, really appreciate it. Um, and with that, we will begin our oral communications. We have a lot of items on the agenda. Our first speaker tonight is George Ogden. You are on the top of the, the list. <laughs> here in the capacity as Commander George Ogden tonight for the first part of this oral communication. I want to thank the City of West Covina for putting on the memorial services that they did and thank those council members that had the opportunity to be there. And uh, this is something that uh, the city has been working on for years and they had it again. And uh, as the member of the VFW and, and Rob Zatello is a member of the American Legion, and for those veterans that were able to attend, we all wanted to thank you. I want to thank um, Chris Freeland and his staff for making sure that everything went appropriately. Uh, Fred Sykes emceed the ceremony, and I want to thank you for that, sir. And the, uh, what we've seen in the past is a lot of the veterans' memorials that are going around, we're losing people that do attend these. And one time when I was actually a grand marshal of a large event, I asked the question, how many of you out there are members of, uh, are, are, are uh, affiliated with uh, any type of a military family or have been a military member or as a veteran? Almost all the hands went up. At that point, I asked how many people are here that are not veterans and don't have anybody that's a family member that's been a veteran, and only a few hands went up. And those people that were there became our heroes. And what we see today is veterans honoring ourselves. And somewhere along the line, we've lost the message and the education. But for those people that did attend, I want to thank everyone that was there, thank the city for this as well. And it was a special honor. The VFW, we've made a decision uh, this past week. We do spread ourselves out to many different events. We have decided that we're going to close it down and bring it into West Covina. That's what we've been wanting to do for a long time, but we've had these commitments. This past commitment, we were dedicated to, um, we were dedicated to another ceremony, and most of our members were there. But we had a number of members from uh, post-8620 that were there that were World War II veterans. And they were very happy to be there, and they were honored. And so with that, again, I'm going to say thank you. And then the next part here, I wanted to just make a comment with uh, Frank Wills. And I'm not going to drag this part out, which I probably could. Everybody knows how much I can talk. But uh, he's a very special person. It's been an honor to work with him and, and, and basically for him at times. And it's been 15 years. We're not losing just a chief. We're, not, we're also losing a friend and a family member. Everybody that works together in this city is considered family members. Special thanks to you, Frank, for everything that you've done for this city. You're a special person, and I know we'll stay in touch because he's, I think he's still on me a lunch. So. But again, thanks to Frank Wills, and thanks to the City Council for everything that you do. Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Carolyn Arndt. My name is Carolyn Arndt. I've lived in the city since 1957, and I am the chairperson of the West Covina Improvement Association. Uh, I attended the planning commission meeting, and uh, I had a sense there was a huge cloud, not a cloud, a shadow over that group. There was not a question. There was not a statement. There was no debate. There was no interplay at all between the, co between the commission members and the staff. And I don't think that's an effective way to begin the long process 
the very difficult process of doing a general plan that has not been upgraded since, what, 1985? So my suggestion to you is, how about if we go back to a blue ribbon citizen panel, two people from the north, two people from the south, two people from the east, and two people from the west, and then for that odd number, an at-large person. This is not about the developers. It is not about people who do not live in West Covina. This is about the West Covina residents. And it needs to be very carefully thought out. It's going to be a long, painstaking kind of debate and planning and discussion to come to a really good solution as to what West Covina needs to be in the future. So that is my request from each of you to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bruce Leinbach. He's created a great organization, he's continued to fight crime, lower the crime rate, and he's done a fantastic job. I'll miss him like everybody else in the city. Also, I want to say one thing right now, and thank you for one thing, is that we finally have the new cable, cable TV with all the cameras in here. And uh, one of the persons most responsible for this was Ray Hernandez. He's not here, but he's home watching it on TV. And he says, here's what he says on a text. Oh, yes, Bruce, looks great. Can now see all the speakers. Excellent, best improvement in broadcast quality. Give the kudos to all. And then he said something else, too. He, he, he mentioned this other thing here to me. And he says, uh, it's right here. Let's see. Let's see. Here's, here's another point he made. Uh, well, I lost it, but <laughs> I just, but, it, but I thought it was kind of just a second. I'll, I'll get it just a second here. <laughs> so my thing here, uh, here. Well, okay. I just want wanted to say it's great to have the have it. Looks like it's doing. He's Ray. Ray did mention a couple times that. Uh, having a little problems rotating some of the cameras. He also mentioned, too, that uh, first comment was, hey, it's 100% great, Bruce. Also, it shows your fly. So, but it's kind of funny that he kind of, uh, kind of funny that he, uh, what he's done and it's very really great and everything like that. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is this, about this development. And the development is, from Van de Hell Development Corporation. They have bought 22 homes, lot sites up in the South Hills, and we've got a moratorium against, uh, against this development. Also, there's another 60 homes that are in the process of negotiations. I say homes, I meant lots. Originally, there were 300 lots that were uh, developed up there. So far, about 220, 220 homes have been constructed. There's 80 lots left, and there's a moratorium because further construction. I don't know why it's, they've been there 20 years. Why, why can't we do something to develop the lots? I mean, the point is this. we got somebody who's, he's not, he is the owner of these 22 lots, this development company, and he wants to put homes. They're going to be over 4,000 square feet, 4,500 square feet between, uh, be, between and about 1.25 and 1.5 million. And uh, here we are, uh, and we can expand it further. So I wish we'd go forward. I think we, after 20 years, all of a sudden decide to redo it when the guy gets ready to build and sell it and develop it. I think there's something wrong here. And you're going to have one problem is this. I think we're going to have litigation from the developer who's trying to develop these properties, who's bought the property, can't develop it, also from the other developers trying to buy the other 60 lots. 
Plus, we're also going to, we're all midst of litigation on this library. And uh, the library uh, is going to cost us a lot of money. So it seems like the biggest growth industry we got in the city of West Covina is our city attorney. You get all these lawsuits going. And I think in the end, the city attorney, uh, I think we shouldn't have to sue, sue, sue. Uh, or be, be sued. So I, th I think we should be a little more open-minded and settle some of these disputes we're having and move forward. Uh, go ahead with the development. And here we got that library that's going to bring us $25,000 a year more in. And we got a lot of litigation costs on that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Mr. Phil Marino. Members of the City Council, members of the City staff, and members of the audience, uh, I have two statements to make and I'll be brief. Uh, the first one pertains to the Oversight Board. Subject, Michael Tui should be replaced on the West Covina Oversight Board. Michael Tui has a conflict of interest when he sits on the West Covina Oversight Board. A conflict of interest exists when a party simultaneously represents two clients who are adversaries in the same legal case. On May 1, 2013, the City of West Covina filed a lawsuit against the State of California, applicable state agencies, and taxing agencies including the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District. Michael Tui is a board member of the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District. Shelley Sanderson should appoint someone else to represent the City of West Covina on the Oversight Board because Mr. Tui cannot advocate for the taxpayers of West Covina and the taxing entity that wants to take West Covina money. Mr. Tui is on both sides of the lawsuit filed by the City of West Covina on May 1st, and that is definitely a conflict of interest. Second of all, the second subject is the California Department Finance letter to the City of West Covina dated March 27, 2013. There are a number of questions I have about that letter. As a taxpayer, I would like written answers to all of my questions. My first question is, when will the, quote, long-range property management plan be completed? My second question is, will development, redevelopment funds or our city's general fund pay for this plan. The Oversight Board, or the Department of Finance, disallowed the transfer of redevelopment property to the City of West Covina. And so my third question is, since the Department of Finance has decided that the property and resolutions 18 and 19, OB, uh, Oversight Board 18 and 19, were not constructed and used for a governmental purpose, what happens to all of the redevelopment property named in the resolutions? That's the property that redevelopment owns. What's going to happen to all that property? Will the taxpayers of West Covina recover the money that was spent on these redevelopment properties? The Oversight Board has a meeting this Thursday in this City Council Chambers at 4 p.m. If you have $20 million that you've lent from the general fund to the Oversight, I mean to the redevelopment agency, and the Department of Finance is turning down a lot of your unenforceable obligations, you owe the citizens of West Covina an explanation as to how we got into this hole. I mean, this is ridiculous. They're going to claw back $12.2 million, and this man tells the Oversight Board, if we lose that money, we don't have the money to pay our fire and police. You were paying yourselves $1,200 a month. You didn't see this coming? And if you say you're qualified to sit up there on that body, you owe this citizenry a very good number of answers to the questions I just asked you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Herb Redholtz. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and members 
council and all the folks here. I just want to briefly also add my uh, thanks to uh, Chief Frank Wills for his many years of dedicated service to the residents, the city, and uh, the men and women of the West Covina Police Department. He uh, uh, will be missed for his everyday duties that he's performed for us. Uh, I'm proud to uh, call him a personal friend, and I appreciate having that friendship over the years when uh, I've had a situation that I needed help with. Uh, you know, he was there to, to lend a hand, a suggestion, or, or, or lead the way and help out. So uh, he'll truly be missed in his role as, as leader of our, of our police department here. And I wish him the best in his uh, new endeavors. And uh, if you need somebody to MC an event, he's your man for that, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lloyd Johnson. Lloyd Johnson, West Covina resident for over 40 years. First, I would like to say to Frank Wells, thank you for for being such a great police chief of West Covina. You will be missed, not only as a police chief, but as a leader in our community. I wish you all the best at, at APU. Now, council members and residents of West Covina, I would like to say thank you to Council Member Sykes for his leadership in presiding over the Memorial Day event. And thank you to Council Members Totello and McIntyre for being there, for showing their respect for all our fallen heroes. Tonight I'm here to talk about how hurt I am as a disabled Vietnam veteran we joined the Marine Corps in 1967 after high school and went to Vietnam in 1968, marching through the rice paddies in the jungles in Vietnam, knowing all along that I might never come home. Fighting for my country was an honor. On Memorial Day, it really touches home because I have six of my buddies on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall, which I served with in Vietnam. Six guys who really loved their country and would have done anything for it even show up to pay their respect to all the fallen soldiers who paid the ultimate price for our freedom if they would have had the chance on Memorial Day. So tonight I'm here to say how disgusted and disappointed I am in Mayor Sanderson. She didn't think showing up at our Memorial Day event was a worthy cause to take time out of her busy day to say thank you to all of our fallen heroes, the same soldiers who gave their lives so she could disrespect them. If this was just the first time, I might have overlooked it. But she also didn't show up last year at our memorial service or our Veterans Day event. Disrespect, disrespect, and more disrespect is the only thing Mayor Sanderson shows our veterans. I really hope the residents of our great city will not forget our fallen heroes and all the men and women in uniform come this November's election. Mayor Sanderson isn't worthy of our consideration for re-election in November. Let's show her the same respects she shows our veterans and our fallen heroes. I know Mayor Pro Tem Herford wasn't at memorial service, but he has been such a great supporter in the past, so I can't accept him not being there. Mayor Sanderson, do us a favor and don't tell us any lies why you didn't think showing up was more important than saying thank you to our fallen heroes. And last, I don't know how anyone could stand up for Mayor Sanderson and say that it's okay for her to keep disrespecting our veterans the way she does year after year. Our next speaker is Lee Knott. Good evening, City Council members. My name's Lee Knott. I reside at 3530 East Hill Haven Drive, where I've lived for over 27 years with my family. And I'm here tonight to ask uh, everybody to support the feasibility study for contracting with L.A. County Fire that's uh, on your agenda tonight, number 19. Um, I started out as a police officer with the city of Covina. Uh, worked there for eight years, and then I transferred over to the fire department. And if you draw a line, you can figure out that I'm currently employed by the County of Los Angeles Fire Department. And I'm here to tell you that I'm aware of all the challenges that a small or that cities like West Covina and Covina face uh, as a result of the hard economic times. 
13 years ago, Covina decided to uh, go ahead and contract with the county, and it's worked out really great for them, I think. Um, I've heard all the rumors, all the innuendos, why we can't do this, why we don't want to lose our fire department. It's not losing your fire department. It's just contracting with the county to have fire services provided. I still live and work in this community. I actually work in the San Dimas Via Verde station for the county that serves the city of Covina. So I still see all the same people that I worked with in the city of Covina. <clears throat> the, you know, the world's changed drastically and the model for providing public safety is cha constantly changing. It's costing us more and more. And I think that at least if you would look at the feasibility study, see if it works for the city of West Covina, then we can all make an informed decision on it. Um, I don't see any negatives to it myself. I'd be more than happy to help out with any uh, questions or anything like that, serve on any committees that might be formed in uh, looking at that. I know that's what the city of Covina did. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alan Sams. Mayor Sanderson, council members, Mr. China City staff. My name is Alan Sams, Vice President of the West Covina Firefighters Association. On behalf of President McGowan and the 69 members of our association, I'm here to speak also in support of the recommendation for the feasibility study from LA County. We've arrived at a crucial time when an important decision needs to be made regarding the most adequate and cost-effective service for paramedic and fire service for the city of West Covina. In our opinion, an issue of this size can't be discussed without having all the facts and exploring all the options. A feasibility study is a no-cost request for information so that we can have all those facts. We believe it may show a significant savings to the city with actually increased coverage for emergency incidents. However, we don't know that for sure without this study. We very much appreciate your willingness to bring this to the agenda. We understand the magnitude of this. We realize that it takes bold leadership to tackle such an important issue. If it's voted to move forward, we look very much forward to working with you in this endeavor and answering any questions or requests for information that you may have. We also will gladly discuss this issue with the citizens of West Covina and address any concerns that they may have. These are tough times that require important decisions. Again, we stand in support of this recommendation to request a study. We look forward to working with the city to explore the best fire and medical service to our citizens. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is John Shoemaker. Thank you. A generation ago, the voters in West Covina elected Steve Herford to the city council. One of the things that they liked about him being elected and one of the platforms that he ran on was the fact that it was much easier to guide youth into recreational programs and the character that it builds than to deal with them after the fact through the judicial system and things like that. After he got on the city council, he got all over different city officials, including police and fire, because of some things that were going on with businesses getting firebombed, you know, and, and uh, vandalism that was occurring, that he felt uh, the people who were responsible weren't doing it right. Another thing that he did a few years later was demand that the city attorney be replaced because the city attorney had spent $50,000 in legal fees fighting the Davises and Mo, He thought $50,000 over such an item was absolutely ridiculous to be spending. During that time, probably one of the best things he did was took on BKK and the owners up there. He got in front of people and said, your health is in danger, the city is in danger, we need to stop this. Now, during those years that he was making these comments, his detractor said, you're scaring the people, you're lying to the people, 
you don't know what you're talking about. You hate the city and those things. And he kept going forward. You know, it's amazing, though, how he is, and he just absolutely despised a lot of the people that were saying that about him because he was telling them the truth. Amazing how we can go full circle. Because now when people get up here and say, there's problems in the city. We have bonds that are, that are collateralized by these same ball fields and things like that, that they're in disrepair, they need to be repaired, that we have hundreds of millions of dollars in debt, that we're on the verge of losing, you know, police are down from 127 to 87 or thereabouts. We're about ready to lose 12 more firefighters. We have equipment that hasn't been replaced since 2003. Yet to comment in Discover West Covina says how we've been a vibrant city with no financial problems until redevelopment was taken away. So it only recently started. Now when people like me get up here and say we have these problems and we need to do something about it, what does Mr. Herford do? Oh, you're scaring the people, you're lying to the people, you're misleading the people, you hate the city of West Covina. So in a generation, he went from being one of the people to being one of the people he said he would never be. Amazing how that works out, isn't it? That's what happens when you're in some place too long and you get caught up in your own hype. Or you don't listen to the folks around you. You know, and that's a shame. Because you know what? If we had the Steve Herford in the 1990s who really looked out for things, we wouldn't be $300 million in debt plus. We would not have a lot of the problems that we have, all the legal fees and everything else. I thought that was amazing. He thought spending $50,000 on the MO issue was outrageous. But won't tell how much we've spent fighting a development that hundreds of people say they don't want. Hundreds of people say they don't want. The voice of the people has turned from the voice of the people to the voice of the special interests. You know, we have, he's fought for development in the city. Matter of fact, he voted to, for the city to be on the hook for a housing development that if the hill fell down, the city would pay for it. Lloyds of London wouldn't do it. Now, when people would get up here and talk about things, he goes, you know, I wish I could do something, but there are certain entitlements that they have from years gone by when all this was approved. Now, here we are arguing about a development that unfortunately, I guess, they're not on the most favored developer list. So that's why we're having this problem. You know, I do wish we could go back and have the person who was elected a generation ago. Our city would be much better off. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Stella. Okay, um, I do not see anyone coming forward. Mike Stella, make sure I'm reading it correctly. Yes, okay. Um, I'll set the card aside. And I'll call Yvonne Hillman. Yvonne Hillman, 3030 East Virginia, West Covina. And I'm here to speak about two different things. First of all, it's item five. Number two, which is the parking by permit only on Virginia Avenue. And it's been quite an issue. We're residents for 36 years. And it has just been increasingly getting worse and worse and worse to park in our own neighborhood. I have brought some pictures, and I think maybe the committee that has seen this before has received my letters and correspondence over the years. We've tried to contact um, several times the owners of the property at Barranca and Virginia, who have multiple, multiple, multiple units, and most of those overflow parkers that are on our street between um, Barranca on Virginia East and Oak Knoll are the overflow from those parking. They do, the people I've talked to feel that there's not adequate parking, there's not good lighting for them to feel safe parking on their own residential area. And it's a heavy, heavy 
um, high density apartment dwelling that seems to be overflowing onto Virginia Avenue. Um, there are a few hours written in your agenda notes that I have uh, a bit of an issue with, and the suggested is um, from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, if this passes, my suggestion would be, because I'm a resident and I know that at 6 a.m., all the people who are getting up ready for work and don't need those extra cars come and would park them again on our street. I think the hour should be extended to maybe 8 a.m. and they should be allowed in our own resident area to park there at 10 p.m. 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. if that would work better. And I know it says by permit only and I'm sure the five residents who seem to be impacted on this the most um, could share permits with one another if we have a, a gathering. Many times I can't even put my own trash cans out on the street as you can see. I have three trash cans. I can very seldom even get one out on the curb because there's so many cars parked there. I just want you to um, realize that this is a small issue in the city, but it's really impacting us as property owners and payers of uh, our property taxes and really a, a very unsightly um, condition because they leave their trash. They're parked bumper to bumper. Many times we can't get out of our driveway. I also want to take a minute to say thanks to Frank Wills. Mike took the day off to be here tonight. He didn't know you were going to be here. But as it, we know in law enforcement, there is always call-ups. And about an hour ago, he got called in. So best wishes to you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is John Solis. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is uh, John Solis. I'm resident of West Covina for 36 years. I have a few unplanned comments before I start what I had planned on saying. First off, as a Vietnam veteran myself, uh, I'd like to thank Lloyd Johnson, our previous speaker, for his service. And uh, Lloyd, I've got your six, and I always will. I've got your back. And secondly, a little trivia about uh, Chief Wills, Frank Wills. I recently was called for uh, jury service. Uh, I don't mind serving uh, jury service, but I had a trip planned for out of town, and I didn't want to postpone the, uh, the, the service. I was called to the uh, Pomona court, and so I, I showed up hoping my name would not be called, and I happened to be called as juror number seven. The case involved a young man who had possessions of drugs for the purpose of selling. So the judge has a list of questions that they ask each juror. And so when it got down uh, to uh, juror number seven, do you know anybody in law enforcement? I dropped a name. Yes, I know Chief Wills of the city of West Covina. Not only do I know him, I consider him a good friend. Guess what? The prosecuting attorney said, thank you, Mr. Solis, but you're dismissed from jury service. <laughs> yes! <laughs> thank you for your friendship, Chief. <laughs> the, the two items I have this evening uh, to discuss with you, the first item is the uh, safe disposal of unused and unwanted and expired medications. Recently, I was doing some house cleaning, uh, and I came across a lot of medications that uh, I had not used, and some that were expired. I missed the May 18th hazardous roundup. So I said, well, what else can I do? Because you know how the, the doctors and the pharmacies have always said, well, you can, you can flush those down the toilet. Well, that's no longer the case. So I called Athens Services and asked them, is there an alternative solution for me to dispose of these uh, unused medications? Their answer was, well, sir, we're just a general purpose trash company. We, we don't know. We, we can't help you. So I called CVS Pharmacy. Well, sir, we used to have a drop-off point for unused medical uh, 
medications, but we no longer do that. Go to your fire department and ask them. So then I, I found a number for the city hazardous material. The young lady said, sir, you need to call the state or the county. I can't help you. So then I, I turned to uh, Shannon Yahtzee, and he's never disappointed me. Thank you, Shannon. He directed me to a uh, website for the L.A. County. Not only does that website give gives you dates of upcoming hazardous um, collections, but also it described a program where the L.A. County Sheriff's Department has these drop-off boxes at certain uh, city fire stations, or not city, but uh, their L.A. Sheriff's Departments, where you can walk up, and these look like uh, the post office mailboxes, except they're painted white and they're, they're uh, labeled as a place to drop off drugs. And I also found out that the city of uh, Buena Park has one of these uh, drop-off boxes uh, in their senior citizen center. Can we do the same? Can we have a, a, a location either at the city maintenance yard or the um, senior citizens? Because, you know, as we get older, we start using a lot more medications. And a lot of the seniors cannot drive to the uh, roundups because there's a lot of long lines. So if we can do something similar, it'd be great. I'm running out of time. The other item was agenda item number 19, which several gentlemen have spoken in, in support of. Um, I'm neither going to be here to say I'm in support of it or against it. What, what you as city council members have been elected to do is to do what is best for the citizens of West Covina. Now, recall, during the recall initiative, the city was just layered with signs that said, no on recall, save our city and fire. A year ago, Councilman Seitz came up with a proposal to do a feasibility study, not only for the fire, but the L.A. Madam Sheriff Mayor, speaks to you there five minutes. As well. The city council um, voted against that. I'm here to say you've been elected to do the best for the city, the citizens. You have that in front of you again in, in reference to the feasibility study for the L.A. County Fire Services and Paramedic Services. Thank you for your time and your consideration on this matter. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Wen Wen Zhang. and I'm the library manager of the West Covina Library. And I'm glad I have brought you a couple of exciting news from the library. And the first one is our children's area on the second floor is being remodeling. And we are enlarging the children's area by adding a new, um, a huge room. It's a play room for the young children. So the theme for this room is um, Pretend City. So we will have a ministry um, houses and a, a, a um, tree house and a uh, theater and also we have an internet cafe um, and um, a restaurant and market and uh, also have a uh, uh, infant zone. And uh, in addition, there will be three um, exchangeable stations. So, so we are going to change them from time to time, like, a, you know, on a monthly basis. So this month, let's say this month, there will be a post office. And next month, we could change it to a gas station and a police um, department, fire department, a doctor's office. And we encourage children um, to learn the everyday living skills by, uh, you know, through learning. 
So this is a very exciting thing that I want, just wanted to share with you. And currently, um, the children's area on the second floor is closed. We're going to close for two weeks this week and, uh, um, and uh, uh, last week. So next Tuesday, next week, um, the children's area will be reopened to the public with a new look. So we are very excited about it, and uh, we are uh, uh, we're looking forward um, to to the pleasure of presenting this uh, new addition um, to the community. I'm sh pretty sure the community will be thrilled, um, enjoying using this this new area. And um, <clears throat> another good news is the summer reading program at our library is going to begin. Um, Next Tuesday, June the 15th, we're going to kick it off on June, um, on June the 15th uh, with a special program at 2 o'clock. It's, it's it will be a juggle show. And um, <clears throat> so the theme for this, <coughs> excuse me, the theme for this, uh, this year's summer reading program is reading is so delicious. So there will be a lot of programs going on. And uh, every um, Wednesday, starting from um, next week and uh, every uh, to the, um, the beginning of August, every week we have special programs for, for children and, um, and for teens and adults as well. On Wednesday afternoon, at 3 o'clock, we have special programs for um, children. And uh, Thursday afternoon for, at 4 o'clock, we have programs for teenagers. And uh, Saturdays for adults and families, and there will be, of course, uh, a lot of uh, food program as well. And um, so I would um, encourage you and um, invite you to join the summer reading program. The summer reading program, the fun is not only for children, but for adults as well. So come and join us. And we also have other programs, like we have a fitness program. So we have a Zumba class every Wednesday evening at 6.30, and we have yoga class, and they're very, very popular. And, um, and I just wanted to add that all the programs at the libraries are free. Everything, all the programs are free. Come and join us. And I want to thank you very much and see you at the library. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Patrick McGowan. Mayor and City Council, Patrick McGowan, President of West Covina Firemen's Association. Uh, I'm going to say my comments. I understand that there might be some questions we have later on, so I'll be addressing those when item 19 comes on the agenda. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our oral communications portion of our meeting. Um, and with that, uh, we move to our consent calendar. Um, if there's any items that need to be pulled, I believe we could pull... One of the items, um, Council Member Sotelo. I'd like to pull item number five and change the time. She wanted to go to right, that's 8 a.m. Yeah. to 8, 8, 8, uh, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Is correct. that correct? 8 oh, to oh, you 8 p.m. Okay. okay. Right, so okay. we'll pull that item. And okay. then, uh, so other than that, is there any other items need to be pulled? Uh, motion is in order to approve the consent. Do I hear a motion? Motion. To approve the consent. Second. second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think we're having <laughs> trouble with the microphones. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, and I want to back up. I apologize. I missed a couple things. There was a couple of residents that came forward. Um, Mr. City Manager, Mr. City Attorney, one of the speakers talked about the Oversight Board and some legal issues. Um, I will give you my copy of the letter submitted, and you guys can address that uh, just to make sure the resident knows that we will be addressing that item. Uh, via the city manager's office. Okay. Uh, the other item, I'm sorry for backing up, is uh, the medication program. Um, I have the flyer. If I could just present that to you, Mr. City Manager, and to Mr. Yahtzee, and maybe bring that back for further discussion. My, my office will follow up. Okay. So we'll follow up on that item as well. So thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So we took care of the consent. Now we pulled the one item. Um, is there a staff report necessary, Mr. Yahtzee? Can we... Uh, yeah, we have no issues if we want to change the time to uh, from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Okay. Uh, council's pleasure on that item. We have a motion. No, I'm sorry. Motion we 
We have a motion from uh, 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Correct? Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you so much for coming down. We appreciate that because that's how we uh, get our things taken care of here. So now we move on. I believe we have a couple public hearings. Our first public hearing I will call forward is number 12, 13, and 14. Can we run, obviously, those all at the same time? Okay, thank you. This is the West Covina uh, Landscape Maintenance Districts, numbers 4, 6, and 7. If we have no conflicts, these matters are set for public hearing. Um, on the assessment rates for the West Covina uh, Landscape Maintenance Districts 4, 6, and 7. Will the city clerk verify that proper legal notice has been given? Yes, that's verified. Thank you. And at this time, I shall open the public hearings. Um, Landscape Maintenance Districts 4, 6, and 7, fiscal year 2013-14. We'll first have a presentation of the staff report, and then we'll hear comments from the public. Mr. City Manager, who will present our staff report? Mr. Yossi will present Thank the staff you. reports. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Tonight's hearing for Landscape Maintenance Districts MD 4, 6, and 7 have been combined. The districts were all created at the request of the original developer in lieu of forming a homeowners association. The funds collected are used to maintain landscaping, irrigation, hardscape, lighting, paseos, and slopes. Regarding maintenance districts 4 and 6, the rates for both maintenance districts 4 and 6 are capped now by Proposition 218 and cannot be increased. Uh, future increases would require majority vote of the property owners in these districts. The funds this year will be adequate to pay for ongoing maintenance in the districts and also for $75,000 in capital improvements in maintenance districts for, for additional tree trimming and sidewalk repairs. Regarding maintenance district 7, staff is recommending a 2% increase to cover the ongoing costs of the maintenance and improvements in these areas. This relates to approximately 22 cents per month increase per single family home. This will help keep the reserve balance steady. It will also allow for $50,000 in capital improvements for landscape and irrigation repairs and improvements. It will also allow the reserves to provide for future repairs as well as, well as cover the cash flow for the uh, district. With that, I'll ask if there's any questions. Any questions of staff? From council. Okay. Thank you very much for your report. If there's no questions, I would ask the city clerk if you've received any written protests, objections, or comments uh, concerning the collection. There have been no written protests, objections, or comments received. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment on these items? We do not have any speaker cards at this time. And if we have no speakers, I shall now close the public comment portion of these hearings and ask for any city, city council discussion or motion is in order. Madam Mayor, I make a motion to adopt the resolutions. I have a motion to adopt the resolutions. I'll second. Okay, and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Do you need roll call? No? Okay. All right. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Our next item is item number 15, which is another public hearing code amendment number 13-01. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Sorry, excuse me. I'm just, I got, I'm gonna, uh, yes, Madam Mayor and, and members of the council, excuse myself. Council Member McIntyre will not be participating in this matter in as much as the, uh, the uh, municipal code amendment as proposed may affect uh, certain properties that uh, uh, he has an ownership interest in. Okay, thank you. But the record reflect that Council Member McIntyre is leaving the room at this time. Okay. This matter is set for a public hearing consists of an amendment to Chapter 26 of the West Community Municipal Code related to pylon signs for commercial uses. Will City Clerk please verify that proper legal notice has been given? Yes, that's verified. Thank you. And at this time I shall open the public hearing on Code Amendment Number 13-01. We'll first we'll have a presentation of staff report, then we'll hear from those in favor of the proposal. Um, Mr. Chung, who will present the staff report? Uh, Mr. Anderson will present the staff report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The Planning Commission initiated this code amendment 
a code amendment after reviewing the number and type of variances that had been submitted to the city between 2007 and 2012. It was determined that the most common type of variance request was for pylon sign standards. Staff evaluated the current code based on the variances submitted in order to determine how the code might be modified so that the majority of the variances would be addressed. On the overhead of the, behind me right now, there are the municipal code findings to be used in determining the sign standards. The Planning Commission held study sessions in February and March to determine the types of amendments to the, that uh, would be appropriate for the code. A public hearing was held on May 14, 2013. At the hearing, the Planning Commission uh, uh, recommended approval of the proposed code amendment to the City Council on a 4-0 vote. Staff has prepared a code amendment, which is attachment one of Exhibit A in your staff reports, that includes revisions to the municipal code. I'm going to summarize those uh, changes. There are basically five changes to the code. The first four are changes to the business identification signs for single tenants as well as for multi-tenants. Single tenant properties are those with one business on the property, like a restaurant, like say McDonald's. Um, and multi-tenant shopping centers, are, are, well multi-tenant uh, uses are those shopping centers that have multiple tenants and generally have larger floor areas. The first modification is to modify the business identification sign in terms of height by changing the tallest allowed sign for both single and multiple tenant standards from 35 feet to 40 feet. The process would continue to be a sign administrative review or a review process approved by the planning director. This allows the largest buildings in each category to have a taller sign and allows for staff level review. Number two, modifying the business identification sign in terms of size by adding a larger size classification for multi-tenant standards greater than 500,000 square feet to allow a 450 square foot sign. The process would continue to be an SAR approved by the plan director. This allows for the largest shopping centers in town to have larger signs and allows for staff level review. Three, adding a new category in the detached sign section of the single tenant standards of freeway adjacent business identification that allows for 200 square foot signs at 35 feet in height if the subject property is adjacent to the freeway or has frontage on a street that is adjacent to, free, to the freeway, which is basically if it has frontage on Garvey Avenue. The review process would be an SAR. This will allow smaller single tenant uses to have larger signs if adjacent to the freeway and allows for staff level review. Number four, adding a new category in the detached sign section in the multi-tenant standards of freeway adjacent business identification that allows for 300 square foot signs at 40 feet in height if the subject property is adjacent to the freeway or has frontage on a street that is adjacent to the freeway. The review process would also be an SAR. This will allow for smaller multi-tenant centers to have larger signs if adjacent to the freeway and allows for staff level review. Lastly, number five, modifying the current uh, allowed freeway site bonus, which allows a 75% increase in size and height instead of what's currently allowed 50% and changing the maximum sign area from 450 square feet to 800 square feet and changing the maximum height from 45 to 60. Due to the potential size, height, and design of the sign under the amended code, a conditional use permit is recommended requiring notification of the surrounding property owners and review by the Planning Commission. This allows properties located within 300 feet of the freeway center line to apply for larger signs than currently allowed and also reviewed by the Planning Commission. That concludes the changes to the code that are proposed, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions of staff by council? Okay, thank you so much for your report. Um, is there any, oh, Council Member Sotelo? Yeah. You had your hand on your microphone. I thought you were ready for a question. Okay. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor? And if there's no one wishing to speak in favor, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition? <laughs> Seeing none, I shall now close the uh, public testimony portion of the hearing and ask for any council discussion or a motion is in order. I'll make a motion to adopt. Okay, I have a motion. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And it looks like we do need a roll call on this, Madam City Clerk. And that would be for the introduction of the ordinance? Yes, introduction yes. of the City Council ordinance. Yeah. Correct. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of West Covina, California, amending Chapter 26 of the West Covina Municipal Code related to pylon signs for commercial uses. Councilmember Herford. Aye. 
Sotelo? Aye. Sykes? Aye. Sanderson? Aye. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on to our next item, which is item number 16. Hey, Madam Mayor, if we can invite uh, Councilmember McIntyre back into the room. The record should reflect that he is returning to his seat. Thank you very much. And as he does that, I'd like to begin the public hearing on the Code Amendment number 13-02, Vehicle Sales General Exemption. The matter is set for public hearing and consisting of an amendment to Chapter 26 of the West Covina Municipal Code related to vehicle sales. Will City Clerk please, please verify that proper uh, legal notice has been given? That's verified. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'll open the public hearing Code Amendment Number 13-02. First, we'll have our staff presentation, and then we shall hear from those in favor of the proposal and then those opposed. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chung, who will present the staff report? Mr. Anderson will present the staff report. Tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think I should uh, recuse myself because this one's really close to the, the Grove. On the vehicles? Oh. On the yeah. vehicles? Then um, if you feel that that's appropriate, then I think out of an abundance of caution. Just for, yeah, abundance of caution. Okay. For the same purposes, Madam Mayor, Council Member McIntyre will be recusing himself off this matter and will not be participating. I'll go ahead and uh, begin the staff report. There are several dealerships in the city of West Covina that are currently not in operation. Recently, planning staff began receiving inquiries from prospective operators and developers on allowed uses at those dealerships. Through those inquiries, staff was made aware that the former Mazda dealership on the west side of Citrus Avenue is not currently in a zone that allows for automobile dealerships. The site is zone C2. The dealership appears to have originally been approved in 1953 1954 through what's called a zoning variance, which is no longer allowed, um, but has been in continuous operation or had been in continuous operation since 2008 or till 2008. And since the dealership hasn't had a valid business license in 2008, they are no longer, uh, the site no longer allows the dealership to occupy the site. The Planning Commission initiated a code amendment on March 12, 2013. The municipal code includes all types of vehicle sales in one category, and you see that uh, on the slide behind me, um, including automobile, motorcycle, trailer, and truck sales and servicing. In reviewing the code, it was noted that there is currently no distinction between new and used vehicle sales. Both are allowed by right. Because new vehicle dealerships are regulated by corporate standards, including standards on maintenance, new vehicle dealerships are concerned with the image and branding of the model sold and new vehicle dealerships have greater financial resources, it is recommended that they continue to be allowed by right. However, this recommendation is to propose a code amendment that would require used car dealerships to obtain a conditional use permit for them to operate. So there are basically four changes to the code that we're suggesting tonight. Number one, amend the code to allow vehicle sales in the C2 zone. Number two, continue to allow new vehicle sales as a permitted use in the three existing zones it's allowed in, the RC, the SC, and the C3, and then also allowed in the C2. Number three, amend the code to allow used vehicle sales with a conditional use permit in the RC, SC, C2, and C3 zones. And number four, amend the code to allow new or used vehicle sales with a conditional use permit on lots that are less than one acre in the C2 zone. That's already a requirement in the... Um, RC and SC and C3, so I'd just be to add that to the C2 zone. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on May 14, 2013 and voted 4-0 to recommend approval of the code amendment. And this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is there any questions of staff by council? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of this proposal? Is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I shall now close the public testimony portion of the public hearing and ask for any council discussion or a motion is in order. Madam Mayor, make a motion to introduce. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and second. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we need roll call as well on this, uh, Madam City Clerk, on the ordinance. This is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of West Covina, California, amending Chapter 26 of the West Covina Municipal Code related to vehicle sales. Councilmember Herford? Aye. Sotelo? Aye. Sykes? Aye. Sanderson? Aye. Okay, thank you. That concludes that item. Our next item is item number 17, our public hearing urgency ordinance. This matter is set for public hearing consists of the extension of an urgency ordinance to prohibit the construction of residential structures on certain vacant properties in the South Hills subdivision located in the single family zone to allow the city time to complete a study pertaining to the property conditions and the development standards for the properties in the residential agricultural single family zone. Will city clerk please verify that proper legal notice has been given? That's verified. Thank you so much. And, and Madam Mayor, should the record should reflect that council member McIntyre is back Thank in you. the council chamber. Thank you. You know, I'm just on a roll, I suppose. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> um, Council McIntyre is back. At this time, I shall open our public hearing on the moratorium extension. There will first be the presentation of the staff report. Then we shall hear from those in favor of the proposal and then those opposed. Um, Mr. Chung, who will present the staff report? Again, Mr. Anderson will present the staff report. Thank you. An urgency ordinance to adopt a moratorium was adopted at the City Council meeting of May 7, 2013. The moratorium would prohibit the or moratorium does prohibit the grading or construction of houses on 79 vacant lots in the South Hills area. The lots were part of a larger subdivision originally subdivided in the 1980s. The original moratorium was for a 45-day period and will expire in mid-June. Staff is recommending the adoption of an ordinance extending the moratorium for an additional 10 months and 15 days lasting until May 7, 2014. The purpose of the moratorium is to allow staff to process a code amendment to consider revisions to the residential agricultural slash single family zone. The lots included in the moratorium are located in an area of varied topography and the rough grading was completed in the 1990s. Because the conditions imposed in the, in the original subdivision are not to the level of standards that the city might require today, staff is recommending consideration of the revisions to the municipal code. Staff is currently researching other city standards and an estimated timeline is included in the staff report as attachment two. A study session to introduce the issues to the Planning Commission is currently scheduled for July 9th. Following the creation of a draft code amendment, a public hearing would be held by the Planning Commission with a subsequent hearing to be held by the City Council. This concludes staff's presentation. We are recommending uh, the, the extension of the moratorium for another 10 months, 15 days. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions of staff by any council member? Okay, seeing none. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the extension? You'd like to speak in favor? Please come forward. Not fill out a yellow card on this and uh, I'm not necessarily in favor of it favor of it, but it was brought to my attention that Councilman Herford lives in that area, and I'm wondering, legally, uh, should he recuse himself so that there's no, no problem in the future or questions? Just for the record, um, I believe, uh, well, I did myself, wrote to the Fair Political Practices Commission, and I've been determined I don't have a conflict. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then no one, anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Okay, seeing none, um, I have two speaker cards. Our first speaker is Michael Van Dale. And, and uh, Madam Mayor, while the speaker is uh, working their way to the microphone, let the record reflect that there have been two correspondences that have been submitted to the city, the city council. Uh, one from Van Dale Holmes from Eric uh, Sheck, dated June 4th, 2013, in uh, opposition or at least asking to be excluded from the moratorium. Uh, may that be entered into the record. And then also a correspondence from uh, the law firm of uh, Paul Mary, Tyler Wiener, Wilhelm, and Waldron. Uh, that was executed by Gregory Wheeler, dated also June 14th, 2013, in opposition to the moratorium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, council members. We spoke, I spoke last time that this issue came before you and requested respectfully that you give it some time and let us work through it. Uh, you voted to adopt it, and it looks like we're here to formally adopt it again tonight. 
one of the things I mentioned when we came forward before and asked you to consider not adopting this is that we think we can work this out with staff. We've seen some of the concerns and the topics and the subject matter. And I really wanted to follow up on that comment that we made. We've met with staff. We feel it's been very productive. We like working with your staff. And I offered to make our project kind of the base case and the template for how your new planning design guidelines would play out in real life. And I think we've been successful at doing that. I'd let you talk to your staff for them to confirm that. But we feel we've made great progress towards resolving these issues and using our project to be something the city would be proud of and that we'd be proud to bring forward. It would be our hope tonight that you would consider that as the path that we've submitted an application and short of a moratorium, the criteria that you're looking to see in your city could be resolved through conditions of approval. Uh, obviously, the moratorium is a financial impact to us. We committed to invest in the city because we thought it was a business friendly place to work and we think it's a great place to live and we want to deliver 22 great new houses to new residents or existing residents that want to move into these houses in the neighborhood and bring something positive to the community with what we're trying to do. So the loans we took out stipulate that if we have a stoppage of the project, we can be required to pay the loans back in full and that's obviously a significant financial hardship to this project. Uh, so I would just encourage you tonight as you make your decision that you would consider that we see a path to resolving these issues that wouldn't involve a moratorium and we've enjoyed working with your staff and we'd like the opportunity to continue to do so but we'd also like the opportunity to continue to build in your city without having a significant financial impact and being able to keep your reputation as a business friendly city intact. Uh, we've enjoyed our time here in the city. We'd like to continue enjoying it, but this obviously is a position that's not comfortable for us. So your assistance and consideration to our case would be greatly appreciated. And I brought Eric Sheck, our senior project manager. He's here tonight to answer any questions you have specific to the criteria that was developed for the moratorium and the considerations that are needing to be addressed by the moratorium. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Eric Sheck. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Councilman. My name is Eric Sheck with Vandal Homes. I'm the senior project manager, which my duties include the entitlement and construction of new home projects. I'm, I'm pleased to be the project manager for the 22 new homes in the uh, South Hills area. I'm here tonight uh, to request that Vandal Homes uh, property be excluded from the moratorium. I prepared a brief statement tonight that will assist, will hopefully assist the council's decision to exclude these lots from the moratorium and continue to work with Vandale Homes to resolve the development standards as a condition of approval rather than imposing this moratorium. Uh, just a little bit of history um, to kind of echo on what uh, Michael had uh, talked about. In March of 2013, uh, we purchased the 22 homes in the South Hills area. Shortly after closing on the property, uh, uh, we filed an application uh, with the city for the proposed architecture to be built on these uh, previously graded uh, lots. Uh, per the council's direction at the uh, May 7th meeting, uh, we continued to work with staff and just wanted to uh, uh, say how much we appreciate working with Jeff Anderson and Shannon Yakizi through, uh, through the design process. Uh, we've appreciated the positive feedback we've received and the chance to advance the, the designs um, to where they are today. We feel we made some excellent progress toward those designs and um, it remains our goal that we could utilize those designs and that the city could utilize those designs for future, um, for future development in this area. Um, we, while we appreciate council's direction to staff to continue reviewing our plans, we are still faced with a potential hardship. As Michael mentioned, our decision to purchase and our commitment to our lender was based on entitling and bringing these homes to sale in 2013. In my experience, um, the time it would take to draft a, re, uh, a thorough revision of development standards, circulate that for review and comment, and place on a public agenda would ultimately cause the project to delay out to 2014 and 2015. It's really kind of an uncertain process uh, with a lot of uh, hiccups that could occur along the way, which is a, a great level of uncertainty that we're very concerned about. Um, just briefly, I'd like to uh, provide a brief explanation to outline the progress we've made 
uh, with staff to address the development concerns uh, without the need for a moratorium. First uh, bullet point would be the requirement for enclosed parking uh, with garages. At the direction of staff, we've been able to incorporate some additional uh, parking areas uh, within the lots themselves. This is in addition to the, um, the architecture which provides for three car and four car garages as a standard configuration. Uh, the plans do allow for buyer options to convert the third and fourth car to expand the downstairs living areas. However, um, we would be open to placing a condition of approval on the project to restrict the maximum number of bedrooms in the home uh, when these garage spaces are selected as, as living spaces, therefore to address the concern. Uh, the requirements for common area maintenance and drainage, we understand that the council has raised a concern over the proper maintenance of private slope landscaping and drainage facilities in the South Hills area. Uh, we propose to incorporate language into the CCNRs that would better educate the homeowner on their requirements and obligations, but also to put strict uh, enforcement uh, rights for homeowners to seek legal action against one another should they not perform um, as the city would expect those areas to be maintained. And therefore, hopefully placing the, the city in a position where it doesn't become a city an issue between the homeowner and the city, but rather as it should be an issue homeowner to homeowner. Uh, those CCNRs would be recorded against the property and therefore exist in uh, perpetuity to ensure that they are maintained to a level acceptable to the city. The requirement for a zoning standard um, for the ratio to be uh, altered to reflect the pad size as, as opposed to the way it's written today, which is the current uh, lot size. Our 22 lots in particular have the advantage of being having larger usable um, pad size than most lots out in the area. In fact, uh, we've provided staff with a detailed chart to demonstrate that our proposed floor areas based on, even based on the lot, are well below the current staff requirements in the current code. And, um, and we boast that our, our low lot coverage percentages are uh, really low relative to the pad size as well. Um, and then just to address on the, uh, the yard sizes and outdoor living. Madam Mayor, Speaker, see you there five minutes. To wrap up, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, in summary, our request is that the council exclude our lots from the moratorium. Without the moratorium, the council still retains its right under discretionary approval with the application that we have filed uh, back in April. And it's our hope that the, the city will continue to work with Vandell Homes to resolve these issues as a condition of approval rather than through a moratorium. Thank you very much. There's no other speaker cards at this time, so I shall now close the public. Oh, I'm sorry, I see. Yes, would you like to come forward again? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify one thing for mm -hmm. the council. Earlier, a speaker had mentioned that there was a lawsuit proposed, and I did want to clarify that that's not our intention. We've planned to work with the city. That's still our plan. So it was stated earlier, I just wanted to say that that's not one of our plans. That's not a path we're looking to take. We're looking to be a partner with the city in this, not an adversary. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I shall close the public testimony, t testimony portion of the public hearing and ask for any council discussion. I see no uh, discussion. Um, so a motion is in order wait, to... Wait, 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 a, wait a second. Yeah, I have... Per um, personally on the council issue... Council Member McIntyre. Sorry. Personally on the issue, I, ten and a half months just seems a tad bit excessive to go that long to see if we can get to an answer because a lot of the issues that I see or I'm hearing... Um, probably can be addressed if we just maybe do like a three-month focus group with uh, possibly sending it to the Planning Commission as uh, a body that can do like a study session on the issue, see if the issues affect these uh, home builders' lots, and uh, then report back to us as far as having to make code amendments or whether we can design or they can, excuse me, design uh, through the, the concerns that we pose with the moratorium. So are there other options besides the uh, 10 and a half months? Uh, yes, there are. In fact, in alternatives, we actually listed that as being one of the options where you could extend the moratorium for 90 days <clears throat> and then they, they, that allow planning department to take it to the planning commission and report back to the city council. Uh, the, the 10 <clears throat> months, that's, that's the, you know, that's the, 
that's the full, filling out the full year. Uh, what staff has indicated in the staff report is that we're going to try to move as quick as possible. Even though we've allocated that amount of time, we would um, certainly try to move as fast as we can. And, and um, planning has indicated that they believe that the entire code amendment can possibly be achieved within six months with, you know, without any hiccups, of course. But um, we, we believe that we can address this pretty quickly. If you want a shorter time frame, that's within the purview of the city council. And to follow up on that, Madam Mayor, members of the council, then uh, city manager is correct. The the the, the ten month period uh, is the maximum amount allowed by law. Uh, you can adopt that with further direction to bring this matter back or have a report back to the city council within whatever time frame the council wishes to uh, enact. Uh, what that will avoid having to, to uh, adopt the um, the action to extend the moratorium again, what you're doing is then extending it to the maximum time allowed by law, but having periodic reports to be able to have you review and consider whether or not you want to stop the moratorium and impose or, or adopt um, uh, regulations and standards. Okay, uh, Councilmember Sykes. First of all, um, <clears throat> warring and, and fighting uh, it's, uh, it's just common knowledge that it's destructive and, uh, and very wasteful. There, um, what we have here is um, an appearance um, that uh, harms the, the uh, status of the city reputation. Uh, we're about to lose uh, millions of dollars and there's also uh, the appearance of being prejudicial uh, towards uh, a particular uh, developer, especially in light of uh, the recorded, <clears throat> excuse me, and expressed deep disdain by uh, certain uh, council members. Uh, we also have a history uh, that there's a, it's just a protracted and, and acrimonious uh, legal battles uh, with this developer. We are approving uh, every other housing uh, development without reservation. Plus, when you look at the history of the city, uh, we have uh, allowed extremely dis dense development. Uh, we had a speaker came in tonight with photos, not just words, but the speaker had photos that shows how the majority of the city um, has been built out in this uh, dense fashion that allows for this kind of uh, quality of life uh, issue of she can't even put her trash cans out um, because of this uh, dense situation. And <clears throat> this is in every part of the city pretty much except for uh, this South Hills area where the developer is trying to build luxury homes. You heard the description, four cars parked in a garage or garages. These are luxury homes, folks. This is not apartments and uh, dense housing developments. Um, these are luxury homes that will bring us uh, a much needed shot in the, in the budget that we need for our police services and our firefighters. So um, we, we are not even giving the staff uh, open range so they can attempt uh, to work with the developer to, uh, to alleviate any perceived uh, potential problems. Uh, I want to repeat, please, I mean, this warring and uh, this fighting is extremely wasteful. Just look at our budget for litigation. Thank you. Did you want to speak? Uh, Councilmember Sotelo. Uh, I have to agree with Councilman McIntyre. I think that uh, 10 months is way too long. I think uh, the 90 days, the, the first one, where the Planning Commission looks at it, if you look at our timeline on Enchantment 2, and it shows, it shows our attachment, it shows 
going to the Planning Commission for study, then going back to the Planning Commission for a hearing, and then back to City Council. It gives the dates and times. Yeah, I think this could, be, this could be done by December. We can get these people moving. We can get this project going. Uh, I'd like to see this go. I mean, if I think I'd like to go with uh, chapter number one, with uh, item number one on this, and this is where we keep going on this, on this item here. Any other council comments? Well, one other thing I'd like to Council Fred, Member McIntyre. There's been a lot of development deals come through. I don't think there's been that I can remember any that have come through here without some scrutiny of some kind and input. And it, it all generally leads to a, f a better product. And this process that we're going through now is we're trying to prevent future lawsuits. I understand that in today's world, when you're out there working, doing anything, we're just, we've become a litigious society, but that's exactly what we're trying to prevent here in this process, just to basically apply some, some brain cells from some history of what we've learned from the existing development that's there, the problems that came from it because of things that weren't thought of at the time, and uh, the fact that there's been secondary and third generation owners up there possibly now, not aware of that there's gonna be homes and there could be view restrictions, and it's a very unique area because there's not too many view restriction possible areas in West Covina. So there have been lawsuits about view restrictions in the hills up there, about people taking away views from people and led to legal disputes. But that's exactly what we're trying to prevent here, and we just want to do it in a timely manner and uh, get this thing started, because yeah, we're all excited to see it, but um, it just would be prudent to, to just analyze as we are aware that there are issues up there, so we can address it with this. So. I was just wanted to make that my point. Okay. Any other comments from council? Any uh, council direction? I move to accept the option one where we get a report back from the Planning Commission after 90 days. So we adopted for 10 and a half months with the report back from Planning Commission after 90 days. Okay. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, motion carries. We'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, Council Member Sotelo's item. Item number 18, consideration of demolition and removal of the Gallister Park Upper Boys Camp restroom building. Uh, Council Member Sotelo, did you want a staff report or did you want to discuss? Do we need a staff report or? No, we're essentially seeking your direction on this in which um, we're recommending the demolition of, of those that we believe do not violate the deed, the, um, deed restrictions, and we are recommending that the public works maintenance staff be the one okay. to demol demolish. I see that we have an option of having direct public, director, uh, public works director maintenance staff demolish it or to hire a contractor. For de de Correct. You know, and, do, and are we aware there's no asbestos or any issues like that? We would need... Uh, Shannon, is there any asbestos in these buildings? Or? It's unlikely, but we could do that testing before the work is done. Okay. Okay. So we have the capacity uh, in-house to be able to handle whatever needs to be handled. Yes. All right. With that, any other council uh, con communication or questions or uh, motion is in order? Madam Mayor. Uh, council Member Sykes. Madam Mayor, uh, just to be uh, clear. Um, when you're speaking of the um, upper facility, uh, you're talking about the place where you have to hike up, and then when you get there, you see all this graffiti and destruction that's been done. So it's going to probably uh, be much easier and make it look better just to raise it. Thank you. Okay. All right, with that, um, any motion, any conversation? I'll make a motion to adopt. Okay. Second. You Second. want to adopt the number one? Number one. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Uh, next item on the agenda is item number 19, a city manager's office feasibility study for the Los Angeles County Fire Protection and Paramedic Services. Uh, Mr. City Manager, who would, uh, do we need a staff report? Uh, Chris Freeland will provide a brief staff report okay. on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Before you tonight is a request from the West Covina Firefighters Association um, for the city to consider authorizing a feasibility study to be conducted by the Consolidated Fire Protection District of Los Angeles County, or LA County Fire Department. 
The feasibility study is the first step in evaluating whether or not to transfer fire suppression and paramedic services um, to LA County. The, the feasibility study is not a commitment by the city of West Covina to transfer these duties, but rather just to determine a different service model. Um, tonight, Patrick McGowan from the West Covina Fire Association is here uh, to make a presentation and also answer questions that you may have on behalf of the letter that they have submitted to the City Council for consideration. So I'll turn it over to, to um, Mr. McGowan. Association. I am here to speak to you regarding the item 19, Los Angeles County Fire Feasibility Study. In today's economic climate, with the budget being crunched at all levels of government, with the state enforcing the clawback law and threatening to take back $12.2 million, resources are stretched thin for many services within the city. Demands for all city services are increasing. In the fire department, we have seen a particular increase for in uh, emergency medical services which most fire departments provide. These requests for services will continue to grow as our population ages. Tax dollars are, are slim and meaning something has to give. We have worked with this city to overcome these financial difficulties. One solution to deal with this financial shortfall has been budget cuts. The Fire Association has agreed to pension reform and temporary staffing reduction models to help out. Other answers were, were to increase income for the city. The fire department achieved this goal by uh, implementing an ambulance transport program and going to the federal government for a SAFER grant. This SAFER grant will end in November, possibly the loss of 12 jobs. Contracting for fire protection service is another option. Consolidation can be a viable and viable option which should be looked at upon as a benefit alternative to an enable improved use of scarce resources. Flexibility of staff, equipment, and increased opportunities to expand services or specialize in those services. Consolidation works to overcome geographical boundaries, ensuring that the closest, the closest unit responds in an emergency, creating more rational protection service areas and faster response times. The feasibility study provides a basis for negotiations if the West Covina City Council desires to move in that direction. Both fire district and the city could benefit if a mutual, agreeable service agreement were achieved. We ask the city council to consider this option and request a no cost to the city feasibility study from Los Angeles County, along with a staff report and the letter I previously sent you. Do you have any questions that I can answer at this time? Any questions? No, nope. thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate that. Okay, um, any other comments, uh, discussions from council, staff? Okay. Madam Mayor, just a uh, quick council comment. Member Herford? Um, obviously, we have a terrific fire department, and uh, we, uh, the residents of the city, are used to having their own fire department. We're the only city over 80,000 in population in the area that has our own police and fire department without an assessment or a tax utility tax or any type of funding so we're pretty unique um, I think we need to get the number I think we need to see what the number is um, as part of the equation I'm not saying that that's the solution at this point in time but I think the feasibility study gets us some information that I think is valuable so I will support it tonight okay thank you so much uh, council member Sotelo I have to agree uh, we need to get a study we need to get a chance I'm sure our fire department done their job looking into this thing and for our best of our capability they've been taking care of us for many years and if this is what they feel be the best i think i have to support this this time thank you any other comments okay and at this time um a motion is in order for one of the following I, uh, are you raising your hand you want to speak or okay all right our options are one to authorize the city manager to con Contact the LA County Fire and initiate a feasibility study to provide fire suppression and paramedic service to the City of West Covina, or number two, receive and file this informational report, or number three, provide any alternate direction. Looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Motion number one, item number one. Item number one. Okay, do I have a second? I second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here tonight. 
And at this time, we drop down to mayor and council member reports. Um, at this time, I have no reports. Uh, then I have dropped down to city. Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, council member Sykes. I'd like to report that uh, I did uh, attend the seminar that was uh, sponsored by the uh, California Contract Cities Association. It was their 54th uh, municipal seminar. I was there from May 16th through the 19th. And um, <clears throat> I was anxious to go because of their 54 years of uh, civil service history. And uh, up front, uh, their, their mantra was uh, best practices. Uh, this is for the seminar. Their mantra was best practices for building better communities. And some of the uh, items range from our public safety, what we're dealing with tonight, and that's what uh, the region is dealing with, um, uh, region-wide, that's, that's a big issue. Of course, um, law enforcement is, is uh, number one. We had um, experts from throughout Southern California, uh, we, and we even had um, uh, Sheriff Barker, as well as the newly elected um, District Attorney, uh, Jackie Lacey. Uh, from Sacramento, we had uh, Senator Huff and uh, various other members uh, from uh, state officials. One of the things that uh, hopefully the public, uh, some, of them, some of us are already feeling that issue, and that's the uh, prison realignment, whereby uh, prisoners are being returned uh, to the counties from where they were arrested and, and placed in prison. <clears throat> And that's because uh, uh, the uh, state, meaning the governor, has, has orders of decreasing what appears to be to the judge's order as uh, inhumane treatment for prisoners. Well, guess what? The county has the same issue. So that means uh, there's a lot of floodgates opening with prisoners that um, three or four years ago would have been held uh, in, in station more longer uh, for a longer period of time, and uh, now we're we're having to, to deal with this um, uh, as a city. And of course, um, we have um, other issues that came up uh, that's in the paper recently. We have the um, cost of preparing for our um, PERS, our public employee retirement system. <clears throat> Pretty soon, it's going to double what we're already paying. Uh, that is a monumental task that uh, we just don't see uh, a way to deal with uh, financially. There's also uh, the biggie, the earthquake that's out there. Uh, uh, there was a lot of diagrams and, and um, uh, reference to um, what happened in Japan. And uh, we know that we're not immune uh, from earthquakes especially something that can be just as powerful as what happened in, in Japan. So that was a, a big issue of how do we prepare for that. And there's also the impact of the federal uh, government's Health Care um, for Americans uh, Act. Um, we have an issue right here tonight that uh, may be impacted by that, our fire department. When people have uh, more options for their insurance and so forth, uh, these troops are probably going to be called out uh, more often to deal with uh, um, um, pains and, and ailments that would normally uh, not be addressed by the firefighters. And um, there's also the situation of our airport. We have the Ontario airport that is much more convenient for us to use. <clears throat> However, when you compare the cost of departing from there, is, is pretty unfair um, the way uh, the prices are pretty hiked up and we don't have uh, the efficiency that we should have uh, with, the air, with the airport. So Ontario is working very vigorously and as a matter of fact there's a legal situation happening uh, to try and take uh, back the um, airport from LA City and return it to local control which is Ontario which is going to have an effect on if they can increase the efficiency, that would help our community tremendously. Uh, and in closing, 
All these issues that I mentioned, they all have some things in common. And that's that uh, they're all going to have a powerful effect on the, on the city and the region, and that these issues are pretty much uh, underfunded, and for the most part, they're just simply not funded. Uh, they're burdens that the taxpayers are going to have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we'll drop down at this time to City Council requests for reports, studies, or investigations. Uh, Madam Mayor, I just want to make a couple comments. Um, uh, true that a lot of the, the items are underfunded that Mr. Sykes said, and uh, the state continues to uh, harm the cities of the state of California. Um, we're not the only city in that boat. Uh, the recent lawsuit that we filed was similar to 80 other cities' lawsuit, uh, basically proclaiming that the, the uh, uh, elimination of redevelopment uh, bill was um, illegal and that, uh, that the state needs to be taken to task and um, our money should stay with us. Many people don't understand exactly how the redevelopment agency was created, but there was debt that was um, uh, loaned from the city to the agency and it started back in the 1970s, so it's not anything new. And when they abolished the agency uh, with the legislation, they tried to take money that wasn't rightfully there, so we will fight that tooth and nail. But I do want to talk about some real positive things in the city of West Covina. Um, for those that haven't heard yet, uh, Lucille's Barbecue will be opening at Fashion Plaza next to Lazy Dog, um, big name restaurant. Uh, we also have a, a off-road uh, business, uh, I think it's called 4x4 or something like that, that's going over on Holland Beck. Uh, a lot of retail sales in the off-road industry. We opened A&J Hot Pot at the McIntyre Square last week. Uh, Guppy House is coming, and that center is filling up very nicely, and there's some nice restaurants in there, so I would encourage people to go to the McIntyre Square and uh, uh, try out some of the new food areas there. Also, some of the word that uh, will come out in the next six months will be very exciting. Eastland Shopping Center will be totally full, hopefully, with uh, some leases that are going to be signed. We can't disclose tenants at this time, but... Uh, I think the residents will be very happy with uh, the shopping center. So on the economic front in the city of West Covina, we, uh, you know, I tell people when I was on the council 10 years ago, we had like five shopping centers that were somewhat vacant. Um, we, we are pretty well filling up our shopping centers. I think the economy's turned. You see it in the houses. You see it in the housing prices. Um, there's a lot of movement going on. So I'm excited about the, the upcoming year. Um, yes, thank you for that. Was um, really appreciate that and talking about Lucille's and everything. That's great. Um, go ahead, Councilmember Sykes. I, I'm sorry, I got two hands at once. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> I'd also like to say uh, a personal thank you to Minister Ellis uh, Lewis, uh, Senior, and also uh, Chief Wills. I'd like to thank them both for their um, outstanding service to the community. And uh, I also want to try to um, impart to the Chief a little something that I saw uh, a while back. It was an unfortunate situation uh, that happened um, with the two homes that were uh, caught up in the fire on Workman. Um, the thing that, that I want to bring to your attention is that I saw our former fire chief, Sagala, uh, making himself available in person uh, that if um, um, the troopers needed any assistance, he was there. So, Chief um, uh, Wills, if you can give us that same courtesy and you see something uh, happening and you think you can stand by to, to uh, give us your, uh, your formidable expertise, we'd appreciate it. And thanks again, sir. Councilmember Sotelo. I'd like to ask city staff if they can look in the, with this new revenue that we're getting, if there's any idea that we've had any timeline about adding new police officers to the city of West Covina with this new revenue that we're coming up. And if you can give me some kind of an idea, uh, maybe we can find some funding sources or new revenue or some ideas. Uh, our police department is down. And right now, I don't know if we have any really timeline or if we have any idea. I'm not talking about adding 10. I'm talking about three, four, two, whatever. If we could start bringing back people back, if you have any idea, sir. Yeah, I can answer that now. We are in the midst of, uh, of, of our budget, and um, we are looking at that. 
uh, what it comes down to is limited resources, financial resources. And uh, we, we, do, we are going to be presenting something in the budget that we are going to be proposing, proposing some parking uh, attendance that, that would help alleviate some of the parking uh, stress that regular police officers would partake um, in doing. And, um, but with, with respect to hiring police officers, that is something that I can see uh, that I want to happen, I, and this council wants to happen, and I believe that's all tied in with the improving economy and, and revenue coming in. And at this point in time, uh, we are going to be coming back with the council with what I believe is a balanced budget um, that d does not take in consideration right now of increasing that number, but I believe that is something that we all would like to see as, as revenue gen increases in the future. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, I'd just like to add to council members uh, Sotelo's maybe just like we come up with a, a game plan where if certain things are to occur, how we're going to possibly use those funds, or you know, um, just it's it's good to maybe possibly think or start thinking because things do look positive and um, the short term is going to be a challenge but the, the long term is looks very bright um, with all the developments that have been discussed and uh, I'm a positive person I think we're going to get through it so um, you know it's just maybe a good idea to start thinking about if certain things are to occur and we do achieve new financial benchmarks as far as revenues and such cost savings how we can possibly look at using those for the police department. I, I, I completely agree with you, and there's a couple of things that I also want to uh, raise with you, is that with the $12.2 million takeaway, we need to take that in consideration and, and let that kind of settle out. And also, I think it's very important that we do start building up some reserves that um, can, you know, for, for long term as well. So I'd like a balance in moving forward with uh, increasing the police department and creating reserves. But I believe this is further discussion we can have within the budget process, and I'll need to get direction from the council of how you would like to proceed. All right, great, thank you. Um, with that, I have uh, time for adjournment. Um, if there's no other comments, um, I would like to adjourn in memory of West Covina Police Officer Rudy Lopez's mother, Ms. Marie Luis Lopez, our thoughts and prayers are with the Lopez family, I'm sorry, Rudy Lopez, I'm, again, font. <laughs> um, our thoughts and prayers are with the family at this difficult time. So with that, if there's no other comments, our, we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you so much.